in the Senate of the United States a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons acting individually or in connection with others in the presidential election of 1972 or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC correspondent Jim Lehrer. Good evening. Welcome to NPAC's primetime coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings. Robert McNeil is helping host the Emmy Awards broadcast on news and public affairs programming tonight. He will be back with us for Wednesday's session. As you will see, today was another banner day for Watergate news, but only part of it, of only part of the major developments, came from the Senate hearing room. James McCord did finish his testimony, and he was followed and mostly corroborated by former White House aide John J. Caulfield. Caulfield said he did, in fact, deliver a message from the highest levels of the White House, but denied he threw the president's name around while doing so. More about that in a minute. While this story was unfolding at the hearings, President Nixon was releasing this 4,000-word statement. And when this statement, the president denied all wrongdoing personally. He reiterated his determination to remain in office. But at the same time, he acknowledged that he may have inadvertently given orders or taken steps which led to some of the illegal or improper activities on the part of his administration or campaign staff. He opened the statement this way, quote, allegations surrounding the Watergate affair have so escalated that I feel a further statement from the president is required at this time, said Mr. Nixon. A climate of sensationalism has developed in which even second or third-hand hearsay charges are headlined as fact and repeated as fact. Important national security operations, which themselves had no connection with Watergate, have become entangled in the case, end quote. What followed was a list of activity that has since become public and subject to criticism. The president referred to the 1969 wiretaps of employees at the National Security Agency when the administration was concerned about press leaks involving salt talks and other aspects of national foreign policy. Then the president talked about the 1970 intelligence plan created in the wake of what the president termed, quote, a wave of bombings and explosions, end quote. The plan for new joint domestic intelligence operations was vetoed by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Then there was what the president calls the Special Investigations Unit and the press and its members call the Plumbers. It was a group created within the White House to probe news leaks, starting with the Pentagon Papers. Said the president, quote, there was every reason to believe this was a security leak of unprecedented proportions, end quote. Here the president feared national security would be compromised last month when E. Howard Hunt was questioned about his participation in the burglary of the Beverly Hills office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Only at this point did the president finally get to the Watergate case itself. Although he was surprised by the Watergate, the president said, he wondered whether there were national security questions involved when he learned that former CIA employees and a member and members of the Special Investigations Unit, here again the plumbers, were among those captured. Therefore, the president continued, he ordered aides Ehrlichman and Haldeman to keep the investigation away from the activities of both organizations. Now, one word of caution here. The president's statement is very long and very complex, and it will probably be published in full in most morning newspapers. And I would suge suggest that the first thing in the morning you get the paper and read the whole thing for yourself. Now, until the White House announcement this afternoon, all eyes were on the Senate caucus room, where convicted Watergate conspirator James McCord and Treasury official John Caulfield were testifying. They both told basically the same story, and Caulfield's comments about his motivation pushed the investigation still one step forward. Impact correspondent Peter Kay was in the hearing room all day. Peter, what should we look for in the upcoming testimony? Jim, for the uh, first time today, we heard during the testimony of John Caulfield this afternoon of direct involvement by White House counsel John Dean. Dean is a man who is supposed to have been in charge of the investigation of a cover-up. Today, he was identified by Mr. Caulfield as perhaps a man who was in charge of the cover-up itself. Now, with the trail leading directly into the office of White House counsel John Dean, 
The committee was anxious to get Dean on the witness stand, but ranking minority member Howard Baker of Tennessee pointed out difficulties in winning immunity for Dean from the Justice Department. The law requires a 10-day notice and a 20-day waiting period, which could hold up Dean's appearance. That probably means we can't get to Dean until the middle of June unless the Justice Department, the Attorney General of the United States, waives it. I'd Are you calling on them to waive it? I would personally like to see them waive it, but that's their decision to make, and uh, I rather suspect I won't have much impact on that decision process. Would it hurt your case much if Dean is delayed a month? No, I don't think so. It would hurt the case if we didn't get Dean. But uh, we'll get him sooner or later, and we'll hear his testimony. And and uh, the sooner we do it, the better I'd like it, but I'm not, uh, I'm not really concerned about it. Are you getting the full cooperation you expect from the Justice Department if they haven't waived that 30 days? I would say no. I would say that we haven't had a reason submitted to us as to why they have not waived. If they did submit a reason, perhaps we would be able to understand, but we have no reason given to us at all. You're saying you're not getting full cooperation from the Justice Department? No, I've said that before, and I say it now. So apparently John Dean will not be heard by the committee until the middle of June unless the Justice Department has a change of heart. Bill Greenhall, who is a criminal law expert from the George, Georgetown University Law School here in Washington, who watched the hearings with us today, is now going to be put on the spot. Bill, from a legal standpoint, is there anything the committee can do to force the testimony earlier? Well, I think before you reach the, the legal <clears throat> procedure. It seems to me that the Republican senators uh, of the select committee, if they're seriously desirous of expedition in the orderly presentation of witnesses, should pressure the Attorney General designate Mr. Richardson to waive that 20-day deferral period. Uh, absent that, <clears throat> I would say the possibility exists that the committee's counsel should file a motion uh, with the United States District Court to require the Attorney General or his designate, probably the Assistant Attorney General Henry Peterson, to state his reasons on the record, his request for the 20-day deferral period. A hearing on the motion in open court might jar it loose, especially if the reasons for deferral are inherently weak. I wonder, Bill, if uh, Archibald Cox, uh, the new special prosecutor, or will be the special prosecutor if and when Elliot Richardson is confirmed as attorney general, I wonder if he'd have the authority to waive that uh, rule. That's an interesting, I don't, is that part of the guidelines? Well, I, uh, I don't know, it seems like he would have a great deal of influence on Mr. Richardson in order to, uh, to request that this be done. I think the, the unfortunate thing about here is the continuity of the testimony that is now being developed requires uh, an expeditious process for these witnesses to come forward as they are as they are implicated or as to which testimony surrounds them and mm -hmm. I think uh, I think it's so important that we not lose sight of that fact and to wait uh, 30 days for a key witness I think is is not in the best interest of this of this current investigation do you not also ag agree bill that it's remarkable at this stage of the game that uh Mr. Dash would still have to be making uh, uh, claims that he is not getting full cooperation from the Justice Department after all that has come up uh, and come out up to this point. But I guess that's part of the game. Well, right? there, uh, his, you know, his boss, uh, Senator Urban, uh, I believe it was on Sunday in one of the national uh, uh, press uh, shows, said at that time it seems that the Justice Department has had an awful lot of time in the last nine months to develop this case, and they can't quite understand why they all of a sudden have to uh, maintain a statutory 20-day deferral period in order for this investigation to proceed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> all right. As we now head into our playback of the hearings, a reminder to keep those cards and letters uh, coming, as they say in uh, show business. We'd like to know your response to this kind of programming. Is this what you think public television ought to be doing? If not, uh, tell us so. If so, tell us. Uh, our address is MPAC, Post Office Box 300, Washington, D.C., 20044. That's MPAC, Post Office Box 300, Washington. The zip is 2044. All right, and in case you want to plan your viewing uh, throughout the evening, here's an hour-by-hour -hour rundown of the testimony. James McCord leads off today's round saying that he fought attempts to involve the Central Intelligence Agency in Watergate cover-up. He said offers were made to doctor personnel records and have the CIA director back up a story that Watergate was a spy operation. He said he believed the government had tapped his phone after his arrest. 
Under questioning from several senators, McCord says in the second hour that offers of clemency and financial aid came primarily from E. Howard Hunt and John Caulfield. He said other defendants got similar promises. McCord said that some Justice Department files he monitored did have FBI identification, not available to the public, but not classified. In the third hour, McCord says he tried privately to spike stories that a double agent had been involved in the Watergate break-in, and then, using materials confiscated by police, McCord gave an on-camera demonstration of how to bug a telephone. The roughest question of the day came in the fourth hour from Republican counsel Fred Thompson. Thompson wanted to know why the Watergate crew left doors tape, tape that was found by the night watchman. And did McCord make telephone calls to bugged embassy phones so he could set up a case for a mistrial? McCord again accused Deputy Campaign Director Jeb Magruder of lying at his trial. When McCord leaves the stand, his friend John Caulfield takes over in the fifth and most dramatic, most dramatic hour, confirming that the two had, been, had met several times to talk about clemency. Caulfield says he offered his own massive security operation to the White House, codename Operation Sand Wedge. Yes, it's spelled that way. He testified that it was John Dean who asked him to arrange clemency, authorizing him to speak for the very highest levels of the White House, but not for the president. Caulfield also identified Anthony Ulasiewicz as the man who made several mysterious phone calls to McCord. And so, as the new pieces are added to the puzzle, here is Senator Sam Irvin. I hope that elusive quality about my handsomeness, which no photographer was yet caught, though. The committee will come to order. I think uh, Senator Baker. Yes. Uh, Sen Senator Baker will be opening the questioning of Mr. McCord. But bef before that, Mr. McCord, uh, it has come to our attention that there is concern among a number of uh, Cuban Americans and others of uh, uh, Latin uh, nationalities that in your references in the, during your testimony, and I'm not suggesting it was your intention to cast any aspersion, but that you have referred to others who participated in you by their proper names, but in your reference to uh, those who are Cuban Americans, you have referred to them as the Cubans or four Cubans. Uh, would you, in your testimony in the future, when referring to the participants who work with you, use their proper names and, when not necessary, uh, not use a nationality or ethnic uh, reference? I'd be very glad to, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. McCord, Mr. Fensterwall, I appreciate your agreeing on Friday to respond to a rather general and even possibly ambiguous question. But to reiterate the question so that it's in perspective for today's hearings, my purposes were these. I remarked that I thought your testimony had been very thorough and very exact. We're grateful for the several memoranda that you've provided to the committee and from which you've testified, which I believe adds to the element of uh, concern and the element of uh, uh, sensitivity to exactitude, which you've exhibited. But I also express the concern that notwithstanding very thorough interviews and one executive session with the committee, I continue to have the feeling that there is still a substantial amount of information which you may not think is relevant to this inquiry, but which in fact may be relevant in terms of other witnesses or in terms of the general pattern which emerges. I indicated, therefore, that I would be grateful if you would search your mind and recollection within the boundaries and framework of the jurisdictional qualification of this committee and within the scope of the general areas of inquiry which we've uh, probed so far. As you probably know, the resolution, SRES 60, which was passed by the United States Senate, provides for an investigation into presidential campaign activities in 1972 to ascertain whether or not there were illegal, improper, or unethical activities. Now, beyond that, Mr. McCord, as you and Mr. Fensterwall can surmise, this committee is interested in broad categories of interest. We want to know, of course, of illegal activity or activity which is now known to be illegal, such <coughs> as the break-in at the Watergate, the Democratic National Committee, the so-called cover-up, 
the allegations that efforts were made by some to conceal the involvement or connections involved, the money that was involved in the campaign activities, its source, the accounting procedures involved, if any, and the disposition of those funds and for what purpose. I want to know who's involved and what their relationships are. Now, those are the general areas that we've probed so far. My reason for reiterating that is to put your, I hope, your further response into perspective and to add one additional caveat. Not only do I not know what I might ask you in these respects beyond what you've testified, but I do not want to limit you by the description that I've made of the contribution that you can make to this committee. I believe you to be a very, very important witness. And I reiterate, this is not an adversary proceeding. You are not a defendant in this forum, and I am not a prosecutor or defender. So with that, Mr. McCord, if you have a further statement to make, I would be grateful for it. That may or may not generate further questions that I'll have as we proceed with the testimony. All right, sir. I'll try to give as much information as I can. I realize the very large scope of the committee's activities. I realize that it is also possible that uh, the committee may have an impression from me, which I apologize for, that I may have more information to offer than I really do. I think uh, I'll do my best to set forth in this memorandum today, this statement, uh, things that uh, have come to mind that it would appear you would be very interested in and to respond to questions therefrom and to do anything further that the committee may want to amplify uh, what I have said or to develop any further information that may be helpful to you. One statement that we didn't get into um, on the last meeting, I think primarily because of the factor of time, was a uh, memorandum which I had written to the committee dated May 4th, 1973, the subject of pressure on the defendants to blame the Watergate operation on CIA and other matters. I'm prepared to go into that statement at this time if it's if it has your approval. Thank you very much. Is that letter a part of the record? No. No, sir. Do you have a copy of it? Yes, sir. Might it be introduced, Mr. Yes. Chairman, as an exhibit? I understand that copies have not been supplied to the committee, but if there is no objection, I'd like to ask that it be made an exhibit to the record at this point. I think it might well be just printed in full and about the record at this point, if there's no objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can read the statement if you like. I have previously referred to political pressure which was applied to the seven Watergate defendants. One area of pressure which was applied was that of December 1972 in which intense pressure was applied on some of the defendants to falsely claim for purposes of a defense during the trial in January 1973 that the Watergate operation was a CIA operation. This would have had the effect of clearing the committee for the re-election of the President and the White House of responsibility for the operation. In two separate meetings in December 1972, it was suggested that I use as my defense during the trial the false story that the operation was a CIA operation. I refused to do so. I was subsequently informed by Bernard Barker just before the trial began in January 1973 that E. Howard Hunt and other unnamed persons in Miami had brought intense pressure to bear against the Cuban Americans and by those, I'll digress from the record to read to whom I was referring and this uh, the identities of these um, persons came to me in conversations with Mr. Bernard Barker and some of the other individuals involved. Specifically, I was referring to Mr. Bernard L. Barker, to Mr. Eugenio R. Martinez, to Mr. Frank A. Sturgis, to Mr. Virgilio R. Gonzalez.
I'll restate the sentence. I was subsequently informed by Bernard Barker just before the trial began in January 1973 that E. Howard Hunt and other unnamed persons in Miami had brought intense pressure to bear against the Cuban Americans who were defendants to use the same story, that is, that it was a CIA operation, as their defense that my stand taken against it had been the decisive factor, according to Mr. Barker, causing this ploy to be dropped, and that Mr. Hunt was very bitter about it. Mr. Hunt's bitterness was later revealed early in the trial when the same individuals advised that Hunt had said that I was responsible for our being in the plight we were in for not going along with the CIA thing. Paragraph. At a later time, I heard from Barker that he had been told that Cuban money was suspected of being funneled into the McGovern campaign. I have no knowledge that this suspicion was ever verified. Paragraph, the two December 1972 meetings with me were on December 21, 1972, and on December 26, 1972. Present at the first meeting, with me at the Monocle restaurant in Washington, D.C., were Gerald Alch and Bernard Shankman, my attorneys. Present at the second meeting was Gerald Alch, and the meeting was at his offices in Boston, Massachusetts. In the first meeting, Alch stated that he had just come from a meeting with William O. Bittman, attorney for E. Howard Hunt, and I received the impression in the discussion that followed that Alch was conveying an idea or request from Bittman. There followed a suggestion from Alch that I use as my defense during the trial the story that the Watergate operation was a CIA operation. I heard him out on the suggestion, which included questions as to whether I could ostensibly have been recalled from retirement from CIA to participate in the operation. He said that if so, my personnel records at CIA could be doctored to reflect such a recall. He stated that Schlesinger, the new director of CIA, whose appointment had just been announced, quote, could be subpoenaed and would go along with it, unquote. I had noted in the newspapers of that day, December 21st, 1972, that it had been announced by the White House that Mr. Schlesinger had taken over as director of CIA and that it had been decided that Pat Gray would be supported by the White House to be permanent director of the FBI. Alts went on to mention testimony or a statement made to federal authorities by Gary Bittenbender, a Metropolitan Police Department undercover officer whom I had seen at the courthouse on June 17, 1972, when the five of us who were arrested were arraigned in which Bittenbender purportedly claimed that I had told him that day that the Watergate operation was a CIA operation. I advised Alts that if Bittenbender had made such a statement under oath that he had perjured himself and that I had not made such a claim. Bittenbender can be interviewed to determine the circumstances under which he made such a statement and whether his statement was in fact an honest error of impressions based on events which occurred in court on that day which could have misled him. Those were that some of, some of us were identified in the hearing in court as formally connected with CIA. Alch went on to mention the name of Victor Marchetti, whom he was, whom he was considering calling to describe CIA training in which its employees were trained to deny CIA sponsorship of an operation if anything went wrong and its participants were arrested. He also requested that I meet with him in Boston on December 26, 1972, which I did. There he opened the discussion by showing me a written statement of an interview with Bittenbender in which Bittenbender claimed that on June 17, 1972, I had told him that the Watergate operation was a CIA operation. I repeated to Alch my earlier statement that Bittenbender had either perjured himself or had made a false statement to federal authorities. 
I told Alts that I could not use as my defense the story that the operation had been a CIA, op CIA operation because it was not true. In addition, I told him that even if it meant my freedom, I would not turn on the organization that had employed, employed me for 19 years and wrongly deal such a damaging blow that it would take years for it to recover from it. And finally, that I believe the organization to be one of the finest organizations of its kind in the world and would not let anyone else wrongly lay the operation at the feet of CIA. By now, I was completely convinced that the White House was behind the idea and the ploy which had been presented and that the White House was turning ruthless, in my opinion, and would do whatever was politically expedient at any one particular point in time to accomplish its own ends. In addition, I had earlier determined to tell the true story of the Watergate operation, and now it was only a matter of a propitious time to do so. On Friday, December 29, 1972, I visited Bernard Shankman's office in Washington, D.C., and let him read a statement which I had prepared, which I proposed to read to the press, on December 30, 1972, releasing Alch as my attorney. I believe that although Shankman had been present at the first meeting, he was not a party to the events previously described. Shankman suggested that I give Alch an opportunity to meet with me and explain why he had undertaken the course which he had, and such a meeting was set up for Tuesday, January 2, 1973, in Washington. Alch failed to appear, and I delivered a letter to Judge Sirica releasing Alch as my attorney. Alch immediately called, asked to meet me on January 3, 1973, and asked to continue as my attorney. We met, and Alch stated that he, in conveying the request made of me on December 21 and December 26, 1972, was acting out of what he felt to be my own best interests. By this time, I was convinced that the ploy to lay the operation at CIA's doorstep had been headed off and agreed to give him a second chance. By this time, I was also convinced that the White House had fired Helms in order to put its own man in control at CIA, but as well to lay the foundation for claiming that the Watergate operation was a CIA operation, and now to be able to claim that, quote, Helms had been fired for it, unquote. There had been indications as early as July that the Committee for the Re-election of the President was claiming that the Watergate operation was a CIA operation. Mrs. Hunt had told me in late July 1972 that Paul O'Brien had told Howard Hunt in July that the committee to re-elect the president had originally informed him that the Watergate operation was a CIA operation. Mrs. Hunt said that her husband had denied to O'Brien that it was a CIA operation. By early December 1972, it appeared that the White House was beginning to make its move. The events of December 21 and December 26, 1972 only confirmed this in my mind. Further, based on an earlier discussion with Robert Marty Mardian in May 1972, it appeared to me that the White House had for some time been trying to get political control over the CIA assessments and estimates in order to make them conform to White House policy, quote, White House policy, unquote. One of the things that this meant to me was that it could mean that CIA estimates and assessments could then be forced to accord with DOD estimates of future U.S. weapons and hardware needs. This could be done by either shifting an intelligence function to DOD from CIA or by gaining complete control over it at CIA. Among other things, this also smacked of the situation which Hitler's intelligence chiefs found themselves in in the 1930s and the 1940s when they were put into the position of having to tell him what they thought he wanted to hear about, about foreign military capabilities and intentions instead of what they really believed, which ultimately was one of the things which led to not Nazi Germany's downfall. When linked with what I saw happening to the FBI under Pat Gray, political control by the White House, it appeared then that the two government agencies, which should be able to prepare their reports and to conduct their business with complete integrity and honesty in the national interest were no longer going to be able to do so. That the nation was in serious trouble has since been confirmed, in my opinion, by what happened in the case of Gray's leadership at the FBI. E. Howard Hunt has additional information relative, relevant to the above. Hunt stated to me on more than one occasion in the latter part of 1972 that he, Hunt, had information in his possession which, quote, would be sufficient to impeach the president, unquote. 
In addition, Mrs. E. Howard Hunt, on or about November 30, 1972, in a personal conversation with me, stated that E. Howard Hunt had just recently dictated a three-page letter which Hunt's attorney, William O. Bittman, had read to Kenneth Parkinson, the attorney for the committee to re-elect the president, in which letter Hunt purportedly threatened, quote, to blow the White House out of the water, unquote. Mrs. Hunt, at this point in her conversation with me, also repeated the statement, which she, she too had made before, which was that E. Howard Hunt had information which could impeach the president. I regret that this inf this memorandum has taken this length to set forth. In view of the nature of the information which I had to furnish, however, it appeared that there was no other way to adequately set the material forth and to do so in the proper context without deleting material highly relevant to the events being reported. I shall be glad to appear and to answer questions under oath on the material which appears in this memorandum, and it has my signature. I have a further addition relevant to that in a statement which I could read at this time. The topic of it is the December 1972 letter to John Caulfield. This letter is relevant to the May 4, 1973 memo submitted to the Senate Watergate Committee and to the federal grand jury on the subject of pressure to place the blame on CIA for the Watergate operation. A letter was written to John Caulfield during the week of December 25, 1972. Reference to this letter has appeared in the press during the past weekend. Angered, speaking of my own feelings and at the time the letter was written, angered because of what appeared to me to be a ruthless attempt by the White House to put the blame for the Watergate operation on CIA where it did not belong. I sought to head it off by sending a letter to Caulfield. This letter was couched in strong language because it seemed to me at the time that this was the only language that the White House understood. The letter read in substance as follows to the best of my memory. Dear Jack, I am sorry to have to write you this letter. If Helms goes and the Watergate operation is laid at CIA's feet where it does not belong, every tree in the forest will fall. It will be a scorched desert. The whole matter is at the precipice right now. Pass the message that if they want it to blow, they're on exactly the right course. I'm sorry that you'll get hurt in the fallout. The letter was unsigned and did not contain any message requesting any contact with Caulfield, nor, request, nor any request for the White House to get me out of the case or off the case. I, in fact, sought no such contact at any time. If I had wanted to talk with Mr. Caulfield, it would not have been necessary for me to go through any complicated arrangements and a trip to William Bittman's office as occurred on January 8, 1973. I need only have made a phone call to Caulfield's office or home. At no time did I ever initiate any such call to Caulfield. Now the above letter to Caulfield brings to mind another set of communications of mine on December 6, 1972. On December 4, 1972, Judge Sirica had stated in open court that the jury in January 1973 would want to know who hired the men for the Watergate operation and why. On December 6, 1972, the Washington Star carried an article which appeared to me to be an administration planted story answering Judge Sirica's query stating words to the effect that, quote, reliable sources state that McCord recruited the four Cubans and that they believe they were working for the president on an extremely sensitive mission, unquote. This was untrue. This appeared to me to be laying the groundwork for a false claim at the trial that I was a ringleader of the Watergate plot. This would draw attention away from Hunt and Liddy and I believe possibly away from the White House, since both of them had formerly worked at the White House, I had not. The same evening, December 6, 1972, I sent telegrams to William O. Bittman, attorney for Hunt, and to Bernard Barker's residence in Miami, Florida, stating that the star story was untrue, as they both knew, and I asked for comments by return mail from Barker. I also wrote Hunt a letter on the matter, stating that as he also knew, the story was untrue, and he could either correct it or I would do so. 
Copies of the telegrams can probably be obtained from the Western Union Company. With the letter to Caulfield in late December 1972, I was trying to head off an effort to falsely lay the Watergate operation off on CIA. In the telegrams and letter to Hunt and the others in December 1972 that I've just referred to, I was trying to head off an effort to falsely lay the recruitment of the Cubans off on the rider, which would in turn shift the focus of the trial off of those uh, formerly connected with the White House, namely Lydian Hunt, and from those who, in effect, had actually recruited the Cubans, namely Mr. Hunt. I have some other memoranda in uh, the statements that I have here to read. I can answer your questions at this point or proceed in the reading of the statements as you would prefer. If it's agreeable to the chairman, Mr. McCord, I'd prefer that you go ahead and read the material that you have. The newspapers over the weekend have also referred to some calls to some local embassies. And I'll try to explain those in a statement that I'll read at this time. In July 1972, Mrs. Hunt had told me that Paul O'Brien, attorney for the Committee to Re-elect the President, had told her husband that when the Watergate case broke in June, the Committee for the Re-election of the President had told Attorney O'Brien that the Watergate operation was a CIA operation. I believe I've referred to this earlier in the earlier statement. She said that Howard Hunt had exploded at this and told O'Brien that this was not true, that it was not a CIA operation. A few days later, Mrs. Hunt told me that the CRP lawyers were now reporting that the administration was going to allege at the trial that Liddy had stolen $16,000 and had bribed Hunt and McCord to perform the operation. I told her that it looked like they were now changing their cover stories, referring to the administration, and that I would not sit still for either false story, and I shortly wrote my attorney, Gerald Alch, repeating this information and setting forth these same views of mine. In September 1972, the indictments came out, and no one was being indicted among the higher-ups, so there looked like a further cover-up to me. Also in September and October 1972, there began to be a series of telephone anomalies on my phone that indicated to me that the phone had been tapped. Further, I had read in August 1972 in Newsweek magazine, I believe, that Mr. Ellsberg had tried for five months to get the government to admit wiretapping on his telephone calls and on those of his attorney, and the government had denied such calls until a court order forced a search of 12 separate law enforcement agencies and turned up telephone interception of Leonard Boudin's calls to the Chilean embassy. I knew that the government had, in addition, I knew that the government had not been truthful in denying wiretap tapping in the Copland case some years earlier and in the Hoffa case in subsequent years for several weeks until disclosure was forced from, from the government. In an effort to test the truthfulness of the government on a forthcoming motion for disclosure of white wiretappings of the defendant's phones in the Watergate case, including my own, I made two calls in September and October 1972 to two local embassies. On October 10, 1972, I asked for the filing of a motion for government disclosure of any interceptions, and two weeks later the government came back with a denial of any, saying a search of government records had been made. I knew that two weeks was too short a time to search 12 different government agencies for such records and believe that the government was not telling the truth. In January 1973, after Caulfield had initiated contact, contact with me, I advised him, first of all, of the perjury of Jeb Magruder, and secondly, of the two telephone calls I have just referred to, plus the other indications to me of illegal interception of my phone calls and asked Jack to check into both. He came back a few days later and said that the government had found nothing on the phone calls. He did not say what he had found, what he had done about the information of perjury by Magruder. In January, I also asked my attorney to renew the motion for discovery of interception of my calls so that there'd be two such requests on the record, and I believe he did so on January 17, January 16, 1973. I knew that the two embassy calls would be insufficient to overturn the case because all that would happen 
if such were on the record, would be for the government to take the information to the bench and for the judge to declare the information not relevant. Furthermore, the government would state that the information would not be used against me in evidence anyway. I did believe, however, that such disclosure would be a way of testing the truthfulness of the government regarding such illegal interceptions. And I was greatly concerned that there had been other illegal interceptions of my telephone conversations and those of the other defendants beginning Jan uh, June 17, 1972. Further, I believe, did believe that such, if such in illegal interceptions of my phone calls had occur, occurred, such would have a bearing on my case. I still believe there was such an inter interception, just as Dr. Ellsberg, Ellsberg believed that his own phone calls had been intercepted. And there's an attachment to this, the New York Times of uh, today's date, uh, title of the article, Warning Against Blaming CIA is Laid to McCord. In continuing on a separate subject in my statement, if that is your desire, yes. the topic of this memorandum is sanction of the Watergate operation. John Mitchell, by virtue of his, of his position as Attorney General of the United States, and John Dean, by virtue of his position as counsel to the President, by their consideration and approval of the Watergate operation, in my opinion, gave sanction to the Watergate operation by both the White House and the Attorney General's offices. I have been accustomed to working in an atmosphere where such sanction by the White House and by the Attorney General was more than enough. As with White House staffers, it was not my habit to question when two such high offices sanctioned an activity. It carried the full force and the effect to me of a presidential sac sanction. For the preceding 30 years, I have been working in an environment where if there was ever any question of the legality of a matter or an activity, it all, would always be sent to high legal officials for a legal decision on the matter, where if they sanctioned it, that was sufficient. I can elaborate on this in another way. Left alone, I would not have undertaken the operation. I had plenty of other things to do in connection with the security work at the committee to re-elect the president. Liddy wanted help. He came to me seeking that help with the word that it had the approval of the Attorney General and the counsel to the President. He said that it was a part of the CRP mission in order to obtain information regarding not only political intelligence but also regarding violence-oriented groups who would be planning violence against the committee in Washington and later at the August convention site, thereby endangering the lives and the property of the committee for the, uh, of the committee and his personnel. My mission was the protection of such lives and such property. Uppermost in everyone's mind at that point in time, and certainly in mine, was a bloodshed which had occurred at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, and I constantly sought intelligence from any source which might help forewarn us and help us avoid in 1972 that danger to the lives of our people. The right to demonstrate or the right of peaceful assembly is a right guaranteed by the Constitution, and I took absolutely no issue with that. It was a 2 to 3 percent of the demonstrators who focused on violence, damage to life and property, that concerned me. In 1969, we had seen the bombing of the Capitol building itself. In May 1972, we had seen the bombing of the Pentagon with the equivalent of 18 sticks of dynamite. In February 1972, there were four pipe bombs emplaced at a police station in Manchester, New Hampshire, one of which went off prematurely and mangled the arm of the young man who had reportedly emplaced them. Caught with him was a young woman who had in her possession four letters which said, quote, we have just bombed the offices of the committee to re-elect the president in New Hampshire, unquote. Found in her apartment were the makings of other pipe bombs. It was clear to me that the, and to, the, to others that the intention of the two were to go on from the police station and drop off other bombs at the CRP offices in Manchester where there had been demonstrations and trouble a few days before. Only their arrest preempted that action. A few days later in Oakland, California, another pipe bomb was in place on the first floor of the Republican County headquarters and blew out all of the windows and damaged the pillar to the building. 
Luckily, no one was injured or killed. Already there in February, there was a pattern then of bombings beginning to, de to develop against the committee and against Republican offices. Subsequently, in Austin, Texas, the offices of Senator Tower were destroyed by a firebomb, which I believe, uh, as I recall, did a million dollars worth of damage and destroyed irreplaceable files. So the concern was not of a theoretical threat, but of a realistic threat of violence. And I wanted advance notice from anywhere that I could receive it of action planned against us of this sort. Advance notice, advance warning, so we could take measures to protect against it and to protect our people's lives. Property could be replaced, lives could not. Questions were on my mind, such as who are these people who bombed in New Hampshire, in Oakland, in the Pentagon building, the Capitol building? How are they funded? Who are they working with? Is there collusion with them, encouraging them? The Vietnam Veterans Against the War was one such violence-oriented group that was already saying in the spring of 1972 that they were going to cause destruction to life and property at the August Republican Convention, using, in their own words, their own bodies and weapon and other weapons as the spearhead of the attack there. These are their exact words, and some of them have since been indicted in Tallahassee, Florida, with additional evidence of plans to cause uh, damage to life and property at the convention. Later in the summer of 1972, the Vietnam Veterans Against the War did in fact have offices in the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington, as I understood. I had also received information from the Internal Security Division of the Department of Justice in May 1972 that some individuals in Florida planned to forge college press credentials to get into both the Democratic and the Republican convention sites and blow up the communication centers of both parties there and cause havoc on the convention floor. That information was part of the basis for my going to Miami in June 1972 with members of the White House staff to survey and to strengthen the security of the Doral Hotel, where both the White House staff and the CRP staff were to have both offices and quarters for July and August 1972. Some 30 recommendations were made as a result of that survey of mine to help protect against such violence, and I believe that most were put into effect before the convention. Now, we also had word from CRP sources alleging that the McGovern Committee had a, quote, pipeline directly into the offices of the committee to reelect the president in Washington, and allegedly they were feeding out on a regular basis policy position papers, that is, plans and strategy, which were rather important to the success of a candidate's campaign. <coughs> if the other side were reading your poker hand, he could negate your plans. We had word that one of the volunteers at the committee for the reelection of the president had, in fact, prior to coming aboard the committee, threatened the life of John Mitchell and of other persons. This was about the same time that Gover Governor Wallace was also was almost killed by uh, an assassination, in an att assassination attempt. There were numerous threats in writing and by phone against John Mitchell and his wife. One such, co such call came to the unlisted phone of Mrs. Mitchell at their apartment and got her greatly upset because it would appear, it appeared that even the unlisted telephone number no longer appeared safe. We certainly had sufficient indications that violence-oriented groups were out to endanger both life and property. With some 250,000 demonstrators planning to go to the convention, we had heard as early as the early part of 1972, and some had made statements that they would be out to commit violence. The questions were, of course, who were such people, who were funding them, who were encouraging them, who was in collusion with them, what are they planning next and where? Are any of them being supported and encouraged by staff member, any staff members of the McGovern Committee or DNC? I had no indication whatever that Larry O'Brien or that Senator McGovern had any knowledge of or any part in such. Just to the contrary, I was completely convinced they did not. But I was not so sure that without their knowledge, other staff members might not be working behind their backs to quietly encourage such groups as the VVAW. McGovern's early political base was with some of the, the radical groups. My questions were, what was the extent of such encouragement, if any, and how far did it go? 
did they let such groups use their telephones and work in their offices? There were indications later in 1972 that such groups actually did just that in California and in DNC in Washington. These were then some of my concerns in my role as a security chief at CRP. I felt that the Watergate operation might produce some leads answering some of these questions, and I've been advised that the operation had the sanction of the White House and the Attorney General while he was Attorney General. In hindsight, I do not believe that the operation should have been sanctioned or executed, nor should I have participated. However, you've previously asked some of my motivations and what the atmosphere was at the time, and those are some of the things that make up that atmosphere and that motivation. My next memorandum deals with um, and the subject of an intelligence advisory committee. I've previously referred to in the CIA memorandum, which I read to Mr. Robert Mardian. In May 1972, Mr. Robert Mardian had told me that he, John Mitchell, Robert Haldeman, and John Ehrlichman were key members of a, quote, intelligence advisory committee, end quote. I now assume that this was the Intelligence Evaluation Committee referred to, I believe, in the New York Times of May 21, 1973. I have previously submitted a tape to the Senate Watergate Committee, which I believe contains material which was a product of that committee and which I obtained from the evaluation section of the Internal Security Division of the Department of Justice, a contact established to Mr. Robert Mardian in May 1972. I have no knowledge of the sources of that committee. As a separate paragraph, Mr. Robert Mardian, during a brief conversation in June 1972, stated to me that he was, quote, going to be in charge of intelligence operations at Miami during the convention, unquote. He did not elaborate further. The next item is headed Las Vegas Matter, which was referred to in the previous testimony on Friday. In January or February 1972, Gordon Liddy told me that he was going to Las Vegas, Nevada in connection with the, quote, casing of the office of Hank Greenspun, editor of the Las Vegas Sun. Liddy said that Attorney General John Mitchell had told him that Greenspun had in his possession blackmail type information involving a Democratic candidate for the president, that Mitchell wanted that material, and Liddy said that this information was in some way racketeer related, indicating that this candidate became president, the racketeers or national crime syndicates would have a control or influence over him as president. My inclination at this point in time, speaking of today, is to dis disbelieve the allegation against the Democratic candidate referred to above and to believe that it, there was, in reality, some other motive for wanting to get into Greenspun's safe. Paragraph. Liddy told me one day in February 1972 that he was going out to Las Vegas and might need my help if there was an alarm system in the offices when an entry operation was mounted later to enter a safe in Greenspun's offices to get that information. A few days later, Liddy told me that he had been to Las Vegas and had looked over the offices and that there was no such alarm system and that my services would not be needed. Paragraph. Subsequently, in about April or May 1972, Liddy told me that he had again been to Las Vegas for another casing of Greenspun's offices. Liddy said that there were then plans for an entry operation into Greenspun's safe. He went on to say that after the entry, entry team finished its work, they would go directly to an airport near Las Vegas where a Howard Hughes plane would be standing by to fly the team directly into a Central American country so that the team would be out of the country before the break-in was discovered. Paragraph. Around the same time that Liddy made this statement to me about the Howard Hughes plane, Mr. Hunt told me in his office one day that he was in touch with the Howard Hughes company and that they might be needing my security services after the election. He said that they had quite a wide investigative and security operation and asked me for my business card and asked if I would be interested. 
I said I would like to know more about what was involved, gave him a card, but never heard from him again on the subject. However, I did read in the newspapers after July 1, 1972, that Hunt had apparently handled a Howard Hughes campaign donation to the Committee for the Re-election of the President sometime in 1972. Gordon Liddy told me in February 1972 that he too had handled a Howard Hughes campaign check, a donation to the 1972 campaign. This is the extent of my knowledge on this matter. That completes the prepared statement, and I'll try to answer your question, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. McCord, I'm very grateful. I think you've supplied a great deal of additional information. It raises a great number of new questions, and I'm sure my colleagues on the committee will want to pursue that or other questions, so I will not detain you long in this first, uh, first series of questions. I think, I think that your further elaboration and extension of your state of mind or motives in the several operations, and especially the Watergate operation, now appears more clearly, at least to me. Let me try to paraphrase the essence of uh, your motivation, if I may. And if I'm wrong, for goodness sakes, tell me so. But I want to know if this is the general message that you're giving us. One, you had a long background of experience with uh, government agencies, the FBI, the CIA. You'd become accustomed to activities related to sensitive matters, uh, security matters, and to taking direction and accepting at face value the representations of the orders or the purported orders of very high officials in the government, particularly the Justice Department and the White House. That for a variety of reasons, when you were called on to enter the Democratic National Headquarters uh, in Washington at the Watergate Complex, for a variety of reasons, including your general knowledge of threats against the CRP, threats against General Mitchell and his family, threats against others, pipe bombings, fire bombings, threats of violence, and the like, coupled with your concern for national security matters, if that's the proper way to characterize it, that you decided on the assumption that your authority was complete, that you no longer need to concern yourself with the legality of it, that based on this information that you had, and based on the assurances which were forthcoming, that it seemed appropriate that you would undertake that entry. Uh, is that a fair statement of your general motivation at the time? I would think so. I would think so, yes, sir. Mr. McCord, did you have any motivation to enter the Democratic National Committee for political purposes as distinguished from security purposes? It's not important in terms of the fact and the proof. It is important in terms of your state of mind. Let me answer it in a couple of sentences if I may. <clears throat> I was fully aware that others had such motivations. My own were the motivations I have stated here. I had a role to play in the sense of an electronic uh, component of the team, and I played that role. Sir. Mr. McCord, speaking of electronic surveillance, do you know of or did you ever investigate the bugging of Republican headquarters, the Committee for the Re-election of the present headquarters here in New York or elsewhere? Yes, sir. Would you describe that for the committee? It was a regular ongoing activity at the offices in Washington and at the uh, New York arm of the Committee for the Re-election of the President, which was referred to as the November Group. They had offices, I believe, on Park Avenue in New York. It was done on a regular basis. It was done uh, frequently um, at the end of the day or the beginning of the day or during uh, sensitive conferences that were going on in order to determine if, in fact, there was any um, activity of this sort targeted against the Committee for the Re-election of the President. Did you discover any activity of that sort? There was one incident on June 16th of some concern at the New York office of the Committee for the Re-election of the President. There had been earlier signs of possibly some illegal activity. 
at those offices prior to June 16th, which I could describe if you like. I'd like. On the afternoon of June 16th, 1972, about mid-afternoon, I received a call from the head of the office of the November Group in New York City, who stated that uh, he and his entire office staff were quite concerned <clears throat> by an incident that just that had just occurred. He went ahead to relate that one of the secretaries at the office had received a call from a male individual in Los Angeles, California, and that uh, she had immediately told that party that she would call him back on the Watts line, which is uh, a leased line, call him back on that line, and immediately did so. She called him, as I recall, at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, although I cannot be absolutely certain, uh, at a phone booth there. And during the conversation that the two of them had, about a few minutes into the conversation, there was a click uh, over the phone which was heard by her and by the male on the other end of the line. And what appeared to be a tape recording was played over the telephone line, which was, as she described it when I talked with, with her, uh, an anti-Nixon and an anti-war harangue. Mr. McCord, could I interrupt you for a moment? Yes, I understand sir. this to be a call that was initiated from New York on a watch line, that is, a flat rate monthly telephone line all over the country. Yes, sir. To a number in California. Yes, sir. Can you say whether or not the situation you described does, in fact, constitute a tapping or an intrusion into that circuit by someone unauthorized? It clearly appeared to. I hadn't the slightest doubt about it. Neither did the telephone company in New York when I called them that afternoon. Could you ever locate the source of that tap? I can relate to what we did, what would incidents you, occurred. Would you do that for me? The, I immediately called after we heard of this to the uh, chief security officer's office in the New York Telephone Company. He had previously been contacted by the Novo November Group offices, stated that they were working on the matter, trying to trace the point of interception of the call along the numerous points of access to the telephone line <coughs> within or beyond the November Group offices themselves that that investigation was to continue throughout the weekend and that uh, reports would be forthcoming as to what uh, they had learned about it. Uh, there appeared to be no doubt from what he was saying that they also considered it an illegal interception of telephone conversations. Were there other okay. incidents of telephone...
Thank you. 
Story. Senator Hill White pressed also for details about the Justice Department. 
Senator Hillary 
said that you're planning to talk with him about keeping John Mitchell in the position of being able to deny any knowledge of the burglary and the body. As we pause in our down and down coverage, we'd like to know what you think of a firm time replay of the hearings. Is this the kind of programming you would like to see in public broadcasting? Let us know that impact post office box 300, Washington, D.C. zip 20044. Impact's coverage of the hearings will continue. continues its coverage of hearings with the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, Correspondent Jim Lerner. As the hearings resume, Senator Lou Blacker is running a hard move as the Justice Department applies to replace the Mr. Reports disposal. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
end of your rather extended testimony. Senator Montoy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McCord, with respect to um, <clears throat> your uh, suspicion that your uh, phone had been tapped at your home, did you conduct any investigation around your premises to determine whether there was actually a phone tap? Yes, sir. And what did you find? <coughs> I had some equipment in September 1972 that uh, normally when you go through a particular procedure with it, if there is an extension, a telephone extension off of the phone you're testing, or if certain types of devices are being used on the line, there is a, an alarm that uh, is sounded, somewhat like a buzzer. And I would make these tests periodically through the fall of the year, and it would go into alarm during some of the tests. There were also many phone calls that had some very unusual things that occurred when the call would come in, in which we would hear extensions being picked up shortly after the calls. Then, uh, and other things. permit me to ask you this question. Then, on the basis of uh, your investigation, are you concluding definitely that your phone had been tapped? I had no doubt then, sir, and I have no doubt now. And uh, were you also under the impression that as you spoke to other parties that your conversations may have been recorded during uh, the time you communicated with anybody yes, uh, about this case? About this case? Yes. Yes, sir. On how many occasions did you suspect this, or were you certain that this occurred? I would say at least a half a dozen times, perhaps more, during September and October particularly of 72. And when you uh, mentioned uh, the occurrence of these things to Mr. Caulfield, I believe you indicated that uh, you cited only two instances. I referred to two specific calls I was concerned about, but I told him also about all of these other things that had been happening that uh, led me to believe that the phone were, were tapped. Did you complain to anyone else? Some very loud complaints to my lawyer uh, in terms of filing motions uh, to Mr. Bittman when I discussed it with him. Uh, did these did, you, did you allege these occurrences in your motions? Yes, sir. Now, <clears throat> With respect to uh, your statements and your previous testimony that uh, you were under the impression that the President knew of the clemency offer, would you please refresh, refresh my memory uh, as to the actual conversations that led you into this belief? Yes, sir. The, the information that, um, and knowledge that led me to believe it stem with conversations, stem from conversations with Mr. Liddy, Gordon Liddy, in January and February of 1972, in which he told me about the meetings with the Attorney General in the Attorney General's offices with Mr. Uh, Dean present, in which the operation was deliberated, he stated at length, that the pros and cons of the operation were discussed by those present, presumably meaning the advantages and disadvantages of them what appeared, appeared to be the deliberate uh, consideration, the careful consideration given to the operation by the Attorney General. I believe I stated that there was a 30-day delay, which to me seemed quite significant. I believe I stated that the 
The Attorney General is, was, in my opinion, a very decisive man. Uh, Mr. McCord, I don't know whether you understood my question. Pardon, sir? Uh, but we're going back to uh, January of 1972 and relating what transpired there. My question was, uh, what led you to believe that the offer of clemency had the endorsement or approval of the President? I'm sorry, sir, I misunderstood the question. The statements of Mr. Caulfield to me. Uh, will you relate those uh, statements again? Yes, sir. Mr. Caulfield stated that he was carrying the message of executive clemency to me. Quote, Did he state so specifically? Yes, sir. Quote, from the very highest levels of the White House, unquote, these were his exact words. He stated that the President of the United States was in Key Biscayne, Florida that weekend, had been told of the forthcoming meeting with me. This is, I believe, on Friday, February the, I mean, January the 12th. That, he had the, that the President had been told of the forthcoming meeting with me and would be immediately told of the results of the meeting. Did you check with Mr. Liddy after your meetings to ascertain whether or not uh, the offer and uh, your response had been communicated to the President? Was with, there any follow-up on your part? With Mr. Liddy, sir? Or with Mr. Mr. Caulfield. Caulfield. He told, uh, I'd like to answer the question this way if I may. He told me that the results of the meetings would be communicated with the President, that meeting of January the 12th, that Friday, that the result of the meeting he and I were then having, was then having, would be communicated to the President, and he said, I may have a message to you at our next meeting from the President himself. This is an exact quote. Did you ever receive a message through Mr. Caulfield uh, had, purporting to be a communication from the President? He came back to me in subsequent meetings discussing executive clemency and a large number of other matters. He did not specifically state that the President said them. Now, <clears throat> you mentioned that you received a note in your box from uh, Mr. Caulfield, which was signed Jack. And you also mentioned a letter which you wrote to Mr. Caulfield, uh, which you addressed, Dear Jack. Now, were you on a first-name basis with uh, Jack Caulfield? Yes, sir. And how, how long have you known him? I first met him when he contacted me about the job at the Committee to Re-elect the President in September. That was my first meeting with him, first time I'd met him. Now, was he the first person connected either with the White House or the committee to uh, ask you to come to work? No, sir. Uh, the first person to contact me conveyed a message to me that the um, first person was an individual in the Secret Service that I had known, and he said that there was uh, a possibility of a position open in the campaign security work during the 72 campaign, and did I have any interest? My answer was, this gentleman called me by phone in September 71 in about a minute, two minute conversation. My answer was, I would uh, I'd like to hear more about it. And he said, well, you may be getting a call. I shortly did receive a call from Mr. Caulfield. All right, who was that person in the Secret Service? Mr. Alfred Wong, W-O-N-G. All right. Now, Going to the uh, matter of receiving reports from the Internal Security Division of the Department of Justice, and I don't want to belabor this point, but how many reports did you receive from this division? I have a little bit of trouble answering the question because of this reason, Senator, the, the number of meetings that I had with them I could probably guess at. The number of reports that I saw there, separate individual reports, would be a sizable number, and I couldn't estimate right. them. How many meetings did you have with them? It seems to me that the meetings began in uh, late May 1972 and continued until close to June 17th. And I was gone a portion of that period to Miami, Florida. 
So how many meetings I would, would you estimate, say you had? I would estimate a half a dozen. And how many reports did you see, more or less? Probably 25 or so. How many uh, copies of reports did you take back with you? I took none back with me, sir. Did you make any notes? Yes, sir. And what uh, were these reports about generally? I don't want to go into the about specifics. About when violence in Washington and in Miami, Florida, specifically in connection with Republican National Convention, uh, some in connection with the Democratic National Convention in which there was there were plans to forge the college press credentials that I've referred right. to. Who did you deal with at the uh, Internal Security Division? Mainly Mr. Lisker, L-I-S-K-E-R, Joel Lisker. Did you deal with others? Mr. Martin. All right. Now, did you have any access to any FBI reports? Some of the material which I saw was uh, referred to or identified as FBI material. By whom? I believe Mr. Lisker. Did you, in, uh, did you check uh, these particular reports, and uh, did you see any attribution to the FBI on the face of the reports? Yes, sir. Some of them. Another question that I want to clear up. Uh, you uh, mentioned the Las Vegas trip. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, there were two trips made, either by Mr. Liddy or Mr. Hunt. Which was it? Mr. Liddy. And uh, one was to case the Greenspun office to determine whether or not a break-in could uh, take place. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I understood both trips were for that purpose. All right. Was there any actual break-in? I don't know of any, sir. Now, you, you went to work for the Republican National Committee in October, and you worked with them and for them until January. Is that correct, January 72? No, sir. The relationship continued until June 1972. All right. Then uh, you were on their payroll at $600 a month. Approximately. Well, you hadn't mentioned this before because I interrogated you about the payroll at the... Uh, CRP, you were on their payroll too, were you not? Yes, sir. I mentioned these matters in the executive session and to the investigators, and I apologize if I appeared to mislead you. And uh, what was your salary with the CRP from January until June 17th? The gross salary was at the... On a uh, monthly basis? Monthly basis. Net pay was about 1250 a month. All right. Now, who employed you at the uh, Republican National Committee? Mr. Barry Mountain, M-O-U-N-T-A-I-N. And what is his capacity there, or what was his capacity at that time? Uh, Director of Administration. And how long did you work for the Republican National Committee again? I was on their payroll through some part of June, approximately the middle. Now, you mentioned also that in uh, December, some of you or all the defendants got together somewhere for a strategy meeting with respect to the trial. Is that correct? I can't recall that testimony, testimony sir. Um, Did you get together uh, at any time in December or before the trial with respect to uh, I think I know outlining I strategy? Yes, sir. I did. The night. With the other defendants? No, sir. Only um, a general discussion with Mr. Barker a day or two before the trial. And uh, did you discuss anything there with respect to the offer of clemency or any help from the individuals at the White House or in government or at the CRP? I can recall some conversations that took place um, at this meeting which, um, in which Barker was talking about pleading guilty or not to plead guilty. 
I can't be sure whether executive clemency was mentioned at that point in time. I think not was. By whom? By Mr. Barker, stating that uh, executive clemency had, uh, he understood, been mentioned to hunt or been promised to hunt. And were you in constant touch with Mr. Hunt during the course of the trial? Not contact as such. I saw him during the first week of the trial before he pled guilty. I didn't see him thereafter. Now, there was an article on the, uh, a statement by Mr. Caulfield on Saturday, and I'll read this statement quoting him. It was a press statement. Quote, I have briefly reviewed Mr. McCord's statement before the Senate Select Committee, and while it does not fully reflect my best recollection of the events which took place between he and I during January of this year, it is true that I met with Mr. McCord on three occasions in January and conveyed to him certain messages from a high White House official. Now, do you have any dispute with that statement? Do I have any, what, sir? Dispute with that statement? Do you question Please. the accuracy of that statement? He apparently has a separate recollection than I do, sir, from his statement, so there must be some difference of opinion as to what was said. I don't know what he might mean at this point in time. But in view of uh, this statement, uh, you still state that what you said uh, to this committee was correct as far as you knew and as far as you recalled. It's accurate and correct to the best of my recollection. Yes, sir. Why did you uh, turn down the overtures for uh, executive clemency? Well, there are a number of reasons. First place, I intended to plead not guilty. I intended to fight the case through the courts of appeal. I never had any intention of taking executive uh, clemency or pleading guilty either, both of which were usually connected together when the, uh, the terms were used. In other words, if you plead guilty, there will be executive clemency offered to you. My basic position was essentially that I wouldn't even discuss it, either one. That's all, Mr. Cameron. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Montoya. The committee will sound in recess until 2 o'clock this afternoon. As the senators take a well-earned uh, luncheon break, they have a new dimension of James McCord motives to mull over. He said he was afraid that young terrorists would use Ford's press credentials to get inside the Republican convention and create disruptions. McCord said he had no knowledge that a double agent was involved in the Watergate burglary, and he repeated his conversations with John Caulfield about offers of executive clemency. Impact's coverage of the hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. The hearings continue and stand by for a first-hand lesson in how to bug a telephone by James McCord. I think that one of the areas that has not been covered is the role of the person who was on the other side of the wiretap, which you installed in May, the end of May of 1972. Mm -hmm. Now, did you employ Mr. Baldwin, Mr. Alfred Baldwin, for that purpose? Yes, I did. And what was his particular assignment with regard to monitoring uh, the wiretap? His assignment was to listen on a radio receiver that received the transmissions from the Democratic National Committee telephones in which the electronic devices had been installed uh, in connection with the two dates of Memorial Day weekend and June 17, 1972. Where was he located when he was doing this monitoring? On the seventh floor of the Howard Johnson Motel, uh, across the street from the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Now, Mr. McCourt, can you see the chart on the easel there? Yes. Now, the picture purports to show the Howard Johnsons on your right and the Watergate office building on your left. Now, does it represent the room 723, which was used by Mr. Baldwin for the monitoring of yes, those it does. And he was then just right across the street and Directly. doing that. In his monitoring, how was he recording what he was hearing? He would listen with headphones to the conversations that um, were being transmitted and would uh, take down the substance of the conversations, the time, the date, on a uh, yellow legal-sized scratch pad, and then ultimately would type them up, a summary of them, by time, chronological summary, and turn that type log into me, and I would deliver them to Mr. Liddy. Did you deliver them to Mr. Liddy directly? Yes. Now, did there come a time when you were delivering those logs that they were retyped? I know of at least one uh, instance in which that was that occurred because I saw them being retyped. Was it your understanding that that occurred on more than one occasion, <clears throat> even though you yourself yes. may not have known it? What was the purpose of retyping the log? Did Mr. Liddy uh, explain that to you? I believe some general explanation uh, in substance that he wanted them in a more final, uh, complete form for um, discussion with uh, Mr. Mitchell or and whoever else received them. Now, who who did this retyping? <clears throat> Sally Harmony, H A R M O N Y, who is the secretary to Mr. Liddy at the Committee for the Re-election of the President. And did you have occasion to observe her typing uh, the, the log? Yes, I did. Did you have occasion to talk to her while she was doing it? Yes, I did. And in that conversation that you had with uh, Sally Harmony, did, you get, did she give you any indication that she understood what she was doing when she was do retyping that log? Yes, she did. As, as a matter of fact, uh, could you briefly describe, without going into any of the contents, what a, what a log would be, what actually would be entered would, on the log, which uh, Mr. Baldwin would first type and be retyped by Ms. Harmony? It would be similar to any other telephone conversation that one person might make to another, beginning with uh, a statement on his log of the, the time of the call, who was calling whom, a summary of what was said during the conversation itself, including names of persons who were mentioned that uh, Mr. Baldwin apparently believed uh, was of significant, sufficient significance to set forth on the log. Then it would be true that anybody reading that would have no difficulty knowing it came from a telephone conversation. That's correct. Now, I think you testified earlier, and I just wanted to get it clear for the record, that your discussions with Mr. Liddy concerning meetings 
he had with the Attorney General indicated that Mr. Liddy was actually meeting with the Attorney General with regard to this operation that is all the way up to what time? What was the last date that Mr. Liddy indicated that he had a meeting with the Attorney General regarding this particular bugging operation? My best recollection is immediately before June 17th, during, I would, I would estimate during that week, immediately preceding uh, June 17th. Did Mr. Liddy indicate what the nature of that meeting was? All I can recall at this point is some, substance, some conversation as a general conversation uh, to the effect that we're, uh, we discussed getting ready for the operation that's coming up. And um, I think just, just the overall planning for the operation. When you, go, going back very briefly to the information that you were getting from the internal security division, uh, was, was your trip to Miami related in any way to the Department of Justice's investigation of the uh, uh, vet, uh, veterans for the, uh, against the war in Vietnam? No. Was your, any of the investigation that you engaged in uh, with regard to that group related to the Department of Justice investigation? In, in Miami, you mean? Or any, at, any, at other any, place, time? any other place? I'm sorry, would you mind restating that question? I'm not sure I quite follow it. I think in your testimony you indicated that information you were receiving from the internal uh, security division and other information uh, related in, in, in some respects to activities of the veterans against the war in Vietnam. Yes. Was your activity in getting that information or any investigation you were conducting on behalf of the committee related in any way to the, any investigation the Department of Justice was making with the same group? If, uh, if by that it's meant that uh, whatever information I was acquiring separate and apart from the Internal Security Division was being transmitted back them, to them, uh, the answer would be no. It was a one-way street it was at that time. Now, you've named in the second uh, uh, break-in of the Watergate four persons in addition to uh, the involvement of Mr. Lydian Hunt and you named Mr. Barker, Mr. Martinez, Mr. Sturgis, Mr. Gonzalez. I think you also mentioned that in the first break-in there were three additional persons. Could you name them for the record, please? I don't know that I know, know the names for certain. I have been shown some photographs by the FBI if you want me to relate that. You do not know the names of your own. Now, have you identified photographs of persons who did accompany you in the first? I've seen two photographs of men that I believe were in that first operation. As a result of that identification, did you then learn what their names were? I heard the names. The names that I originally, what I'm trying to say is the names I originally heard were apparently not the true names, so I can't associate the two together that way. But the photographs. One, um, one individual was, uh, I believe, that I made a, a probable identification of was a Mr. Felipe Di Diego. And the other name associated with the photograph that I identified was a Mr. Rinaldo, R-E-I-N-A-L-D-O, Pico, P-I-C-O. Now, now, Mr. McCord, I've had placed at your table a telephone which is not connected to anything. And what I would like you to do, because you've testified with regard to a particular bugging operation at Democrat National Committee headquarters, if you would demonstrate to the committee the manner in which you placed the so-called bug in the telephone, and would I please uh, like to ask the party who has 
the custody of the receiver to please take the receiver over to the table. My, uh, my counsel asked for assurance that I won't be prosecuted on this installation. As I said, the telephone's connected, uh, is not connected, and no conversation is being involved. Now, I also will show you a item which is, was entered as an exhibit, as exhibit 16B at the trial, and I understand was taken from either your possession or in the vicinity of where you were when you were arrested, and I think is a miniature transmitter a microphone and ask if you would identify that. Yes, I believe this is the one entered into evidence. Yes, now would you identify exactly what that is? This is a radio, essentially a radio transmitter, which is powered by the power within the telephone system, the telephone line itself, and this transmitter is connect, was connected or was for the purpose of being connected into the telephone uh, itself, for the purpose of transmitting those conversations over the phone. When that, when that transmitter is connected in the telephone, uh, is it capable of picking up both sides of the conversation and yes, broadcasting sir. it to another place? Yes, it is. Could you just demonstrate not, not actually attaching it, how you would place that in that telephone that's before you. The cover would be taken off of the telephone. Could and you the, lift the base a little so that the sir. Senate committee can see what you're doing? The cover would be taken off of the telephone and two of the wires connected with this would be interconnected in series with the wiring within the phone itself. And the, um, this is the antenna, which would be concealed underneath the telephone mechanism. The device itself would be likewise concealed under the, some portion of the telephone mechanism. There are three or four places that it could be put. And uh, essentially, that's, that's the uh, technique of the installation. All right. Now, would there be any wires, since you're talking about a trim?
Police nearly two days of testimony by convicted Watergate conspirator James McCool. Watch McCool's testimony today involved his contact with Treasury Department official John Caulfield, who urged McCool to plead guilty and keep his mouth shut and await the executive council. Next, Caulfield will tell his version of the story. Our primetime coverage is an experiment. We're curious about your reaction. Do you want us to continue it or do you want us to knock it off? Send your cards to Impact Box 300. Washington, D.C., 20044. In fact, some of his coverage of the hearings will continue after station identification. Our latest coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the public broadcasting service. Washington, IMPACT continues its coverage of hearings with the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Letterman. The hearing resumes with the testimony of John Caulfield, former New York policeman and former member of the White House staff. Mr. John J. Caulfield, today.
Assassination of Reverend Kennedy in early June, my duties changed to Hudson and Lee, starting with the end of the 1968 convention. I became responsible to Mr. John Arlington for being sure that the staff headquarters, excuse me, the staff quarters and working areas of the Nixon campaign and travel staff were secure and I was a country moved from city to city during the campaign. Thank you. 
management is working out with Mr. Osborne, Mr. Henry Conrad, and Mr. Anthony Lasowitz. Mr. Lasowitz retired from the New York City Police Department and was paid on a monthly basis by the Combat Law Firm that employment agency on July 9, 1969. During the next three years, there was no notice from Mr. Osborne, and later in some instances, from Mr. John Dean, Mr. Lasowitz, and my supervision performed a variety of investigative functions, reporting the results of his findings to the White House through me. I do not fully recall all of the investigations performed in this fashion, but have available a list of those which have been recalled if the committee wishes to accept them. In July of 1970, Mr. John Dean to the President, and Mr. Rothman was named into the position of Presidential Assistant for Domestic Affairs. Mr. Rothman, I don't think I've reported to Dean on one occasion. He said he would think about it and get back to me. A few days later, I received a call from his office asking if I would come to Washington and discuss this matter, and that meeting resulted in my appointment as White House staff on April 8, 1969. Consisted of being a White House liaison with a variety of 
law enforcement agencies and the federal government. Through arrangements worked out with Mr. Arnold, Mr. Herbert Combine, and Mr. Anthony Lasowitz, Mr. Lasowitz retired from the New York City Police Department and was paid on a monthly basis by the Combine Law Firm at employment commencing on July 9, 1969. During the next three years, first on orders from Mr. Rothman, and later in some instances, on orders from Mr. John Day, Mr. Yasowitz, under my supervision, performed a variety of investigative functions, reporting the results of his findings to the White House through me. I do not fully recall all of the investigations performed in this fashion, but have available a list of those which I do recall if the committee wishes to accept it. In July of 1970, Mr. John Dean became counsel to the President, and Mr. Rothman was named to the position of Presidential Assistant for Domestic Affairs. Thereafter, I worked directly for Mr. Dean, but on occasion, Mr. Rothman continued to call upon me directly for investigative work involving the services of Mr. Yanosovitz. In the spring of 1971, I began to notice that, for some reason, the amount of investigative work handled by Mr. Lasowitz through me had diminished. Much of the talk on the White House was beginning to censor more and more of the 1972 presidential election, and I began to examine ways in my mind in which I might become involved. Since I had performed security duties in the 1968 election campaign, and realizing some of the security demands of a presidential campaign, I wished to become involved in the security area of the campaign. So at that end, I composed a memorandum suggesting that an outside security capability be formed to handle the demands, the demands of this 1972 campaign. Such an organization would have the capability to perform various security functions to ensure the security of the traveling staff, the committee to re-elect the president's headquarters, the convention site, and to employ various guards and security people. In short, I was suggesting the formation of a capability to want to cover the security needs of a presidential campaign. The name I gave to this suggested operation was Sandwich. I further suggested that I leave the White House then and set up this security entity if it were approved and suggested a budget of approximately $300,000 to $400,000. I gave the memorandum to Mr. Dean and got a strong impression from him that it went to high levels, but I have no knowledge of who saw it. During the summer of 1971, I had high hopes that my proposal would be accepted. I had one other direct conversation at lunch about its contents with Mr. Dean and with Mr. Jeff McCrory. Between the end of June and October of 1971, I inquired with Mr. Dean as to the status of my proposal on numerous occasions, but ultimately was told by Mr. Dean that he didn't think my suggestion was going anywhere. spoke with Mr. Dean concerning obtaining a position as a personal aide to John Mitchell when he became campaign director. Mr. Dean agreed to ask Mr. Mitchell if such a position was available. He did so, and on November 24, 1971, he accompanied me to an interview at Mr. Mitchell's office. I explained to Mr. Mitchell I wanted was a position similar to that occupied by Dwight Chapman in relation to the President, and that in addition to any of the kinds of activities that Chapman had for the President, I could be of value to Mr. Mitchell as a bodyguard. Mr. Mitchell listened to what I had to say, but was noncommittal as to what status I would occupy with him. He said, however, that we could get that all straightened out when I arrived at the re-election was unsure as to when he would join the re-election committee, but thought that it would be sometime in January or February of 1972. But on his 
service and run back to my house by myself. Mr. Dean today, and as I was walking through Mr. Mitchell's outer office, I noted Mr. Gordon Lay sitting with Mr. Dean, evidently waiting to see Mr. Mitchell. At that time, I was sure I had a position with Mr. Mitchell, but the nature of my duties was quite unsettled. Ultimately, on the 1st of March, 1972, I went to the re election committee to, con to commence my duties there. It soon became clear to me that Mr. Mitchell regarded me only as a bodyguard, which was not what I had in mind at all. Every March, I took two trips with Mr. Mitchell outside of Washington, one brief trip to New York City, and the other to keep his hand Florida. Since Mr. Mitchell regarded me as his personal bodyguard, I carried a revolver in my briefcase. By the time the trip to Florida occurred in late March, I was already in touch with a friend of mine at the Treasury Department about possible employment there. After being in Florida for approximately two to three days, I received word that my house in Fairfax, Virginia, had been burglarized, and so I flew home to attend to my wife and family. Mr. Fred LaRue had joined us in Florida and had for our arrival. And upon my departure, he asked that I leave my revolver in his possession, since Mrs. Mitchell would feel better if there were a revolver on the premises. I gave my revolver to him and ultimately received it back in May of 1972 after LaRue had given it to Mr. James McCormick for safekeeping on Mr. LaRue's return to Florida. Once I returned from Florida, I performed no more duties of any kind for Mr. Mitchell. I then formally decided to seek employment with the Treasury Department, which I ultimately obtained. On April 28, I started working for the Treasury Department and then became staff assistant to the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Enforcement. And on July 1, 1972, I became an Acting Assistant Director for Enforcement, Bureau of Alcohol. September of 1971, I received a call from Mr. Barry Martin of the Republican National Committee, who informed me that John Reagan was leaving his duties as security officer on the National Committee, the Republican National Committee. He asked me if I knew of anyone who would be interested in the position, and I said no, but I would check around. I subsequently asked Mr. Bell Wong, the Deputy Assistant Director of the Secret Service, if you knew of anyone to recommend for such a position. He told me that he could recommend highly a former colleague and retired CIA agent, Mr. James McCormick, and gave me his telephone number. I then called Mr. McCormick and invited him to my office for an interview. Mr. McCormick provided me with a resume, and as a result of my interview with him, I called Mr. Mountain and arranged for Mr. McCormick see Mr. Mountain. He did so and was thereafter hired by the Republican National Committee. <laughs> Since before leaving his employment, Mr. Reagan had intended to handle security for the Committee to re-elect the President, offices as well as the National Committee. It was natural that Mr. McCord, upon being hired by the National Committee, was soon interviewed by Mr. Robin Hall, the office manager of the Committee to re-elect the President. In late December or early January, Mr. McCord was hired by the Committee to re-elect the President also. I had been consulted about him by the re-election Committee and recommended him for this position also. Between our original meeting in September 1971 and June 1972, Mr. McCord and I grew to be personal friends. Even though we did not physically see each other frequently, with the exception of the month of March 1972, 
used to be even doing that. I did say that the people who had asked me to convey the message that I was doing nothing but words meeting, if I thought it was a sincere one. They asked me who I was speaking with. At the very outset, I said I could not reveal any names, but they that they went from the highest level of the White House. He continually said that all he was interested in was his freedom, and that he was not pleased that others who he felt was involved in not suffering the consequences that he wants. In the context of demanding his immediate freedom, he said that in the way in which his freedom could be obtained, and asked me if I could convey his plan to the people at the White House with whom I was talking. His plan simply was as follows. On two occasions, one in September 1972, and the other in October 1972, Mr. McCaw told me that he had called telephone numbers at foreign embassies in Washington and stated he was sure these embassies were subject to national security wiretaps. On both occasions, he stated that he was a man involved in the Watergate scandal and, without giving his name, had inquired as to the possibility of acquiring visas and other travel papers necessary to travel to these foreign countries. Search his credit card records. He would find records of these two calls. Meanwhile, Mr. McCord and his attorneys would make a motion to the court aimed at dismissing the case against Mr. McCord because of the use of wiretap evidence by the prosecution. Mr. McCord's idea was that when the U.S. attorney was called and at least two of Mr. McCord's conversations had been intercepted, to dismiss the case rather than reveal that the two embassies in question were the subject of national security wiretaps. Mr. McCall was quite adamant in saying that he was sure the government could secure his immediate release if they wanted to help him. And rather than the publicity and cover up of the government being forced to dismiss the case against him, such an approach would save the administration any real embarrassment. recently in the Elsmere case, and he saw no reason why the government could not at least accomplish this for him. I told Mr. McCord that I would be back to him on the wire tap situation, and would possibly be calling him in a day or two to set this up. I agreed to carry this message concerning wire taps back to the White House at the meeting ended. At no time in the first meeting do I recall saying anything about the president. I specifically renewed the offer of executive limits, as indicated above, and referred to it as coming from the highest levels of the White House. At some point in the conversation, Mr. McCord said to me, Jack, I didn't ask to see you. This puzzled me, despite little understanding from Mr. Dean, or whether Mr. Cord had specifically asked to see me. In any event, I told Mr. Dean on Friday night, January 12, and reported that Mr. McCord did not seem interested in, accept, in accepting the offer. Made in Mr. Dean's original message to him, that Mr. McCord wanted his immediate freedom, and that he would have thought that he had a way to obtain that freedom. I then mentioned over the telephone McCord's idea of prosecuting his freedom because of the use of national security wiretaps said that I wish to discuss this matter directly with Mr. Dean. The following day, I saw Mr. Dean in his office in the White House and explained to him what Mr. McCord said it was a gesture of obtaining his freedom, as Mr. McCord had described it to me. He then turned the conversation back to Mr. Dean said, excuse me, Mr. Dean said, well, I'll check on that. Turn the conversation back to the offer of executive clemency. Mr. 
taking a break for about a month, and they think he fell, but this John Caulfield. Clemency was a sincere and believable offer coming from the very highest levels of the White House. I explained to him that among the reasons why I believed that such a commitment would be kept were that the White House officials with whom I was in contact were extremely concerned about the Watergate burglary developing into a major scandal affecting the President, and therefore such a promise would not be given lightly. I told him that the White House officials with whom I was talking were complaining because they felt that Mr. McCord was the only one of the Watergate burglary defendants who was refusing to cooperate. 
at no time on this occasion or on any other occasion do I recall telling Mr. McCord to keep silent if called before Mr. the Mr. Caulfield. Um, he got a, another vote, and I think maybe we'd better pause till we get back. Yes. The committee is taking a break during a floor vote on a pending banking bill. A witness, John Caulfield, will still be testifying when the committee remembers return. Impact's continuing coverage of the campaign activities hearings resumes after this station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, Correspondent Jim Lehrer. Treasury Department official John Caulfield now continues reading his prepared statement. The committee will resume this. Uh, Mr. Caulfield, uh, you were in the midst of reading your statement. I would suggest perhaps you go back maybe a sentence or two so we have continuity in what you're saying. Yes, sir. No, right here. Actually, perhaps to the last full thought that you wanted to express in your statement. I'll pick it up for a couple of sentences back, Mr. Dash. I told him that the White House officials with whom I was talking were, complain were complaining because they felt that Mr. McCord was the only one of the Watergate burglary defendants who was refusing to cooperate. At no time on this occasion or on any other occasion do I recall telling Mr. McCord to keep silent if called before the grand jury or any congressional committees. His response to my conversation was that he still wanted his immediate freedom, and he felt strongly that if the White House had any interest in helping him secure that freedom, that they could do something about the two calls which he was sure had been intercepted. I told him I would check on this matter again and get back to him. I was not attempting to exert pressure on Mr. McCord by telling him of comments I was hearing from the White House, merely I was attempting to let him know the kinds of things I was hearing from Mr. Dean concerning the White House's attitude towards him 
if that would be of any assistance to him. Later on Sunday, I telephoned Mr. Dean to report of my meeting with Mr. McCord. I told him that, in my opinion, Mr. McCord had absolutely no interest in the offer of executive clemency. I told Mr. Dean that Mr. McCord was still adamant in his belief that the White House had the power to have the charges against him dismissed if it would merely pursue the wiretaps which he had mentioned. Mr. Dean said that I should tell him that there wasn't much likelihood that anything would be done about the wiretap situation. And in response to my comments about McCord's refusal to consider executive clemency, he said something like, well, what the hell does he know anyway? <clears throat> Mr. Dean told me to go back to Mr. McCord again and commiserate with him but he did not ask me to renew the offer of executive clemency. I guessed that the reason why he wanted me to see Mr. McCord again was simply to maintain a friendly relationship with him in case there was a need for any further conversation with him through me. I probably would have met with him again anyway since I felt badly about his predicament and I considered him a good friend. In any event, on Monday, January 15, I called McCord to report that nothing seemed to be happening in regard to the wiretap situation. He became quite angry over the telephone and reaffirmed his belief that if the White House really wanted to help him, they could do so by using the method he had suggested and that he knew that Mr. Magruder, who was then going to be a government witness, was going to perjure himself. I also mentioned getting together with him, but he said he had no interest in seeing me unless I had something more to talk to him about. He was quite upset, so I did not pursue the matter further. On Tuesday, January 16, I again called him in an attempt to meet with him, and he again was highly irritated about the White House's failure to do something about the wiretap situation, and again mentioned Mr. Magruder. I said I would inquire further about the wiretaps, and I might have something for him in a week or so. Subsequently, I called him and arranged to meet with him again, the exact date of this meeting being unsure of my mind. We again met at the Overlook on the George Washington Parkway. He got into my car, and we drove out the parkway, pursuing a course in the general direction of Warrington, Virginia. I have no specific recollection as to how long we drove, but I would say that it was an hour or two. I would characterize this conversation as a very friendly one, in which a large portion of the time was spent discussing our respective families, how my job at the Treasury Department was going, and various other purely personal matters. I gave him my private telephone number at the Treasury Department and told him that if he or his wife ever wanted, to, wanted me to do anything for them, they should feel free to call me. I told McCord that he, if he or his wife should decide to call me, to simply use the name Watson and I would know who it was. Frankly, this was merely a device to save me from any possible embarrassment. I do not have a specific recollection as to how it arose but I believe he asked me if he was still the only one of the Watergate defendants that the White House was concerned about. I said that I thought he was, but that I had no knowledge of what relationship existed between the White House and the other Watergate defendants. He said that the Cuban defendants were quite nervous and, in his opinion, might make a statement at any time and that I could pass that along for whatever it was worth. I told him that there was absolutely no hope, in my opinion, of the White House ever doing anything about the wiretap situation, and asked him when he thought he might make a statement. He said that he had not decided that yet, but that he had spoken to his wife and family, and that he felt free to make a statement whenever he thought the time was right. 
I again asked if there was anything I could do for him. He said one thing that I could do was to see whether bail money could be raised for him pending an appeal in his case. I said I would check into this. Toward the end of our conversation, realizing that he had definitely was going to make a statement on the Watergate burglary at a time of his choosing, and that such a statement would in all probability involve allegations against people in the White House and other high administration officials, I gave him what I considered to be a small piece of friendly advice. I said, words to the effect, Jim, I have worked with these people and I know them to be as tough-minded as you and I. When you make your statement, don't underestimate them. If I were in your shoes, I would probably do the same thing. I later called Mr. Dean and advised him of Mr. McCord's request for bail funding, and he said words to the effect that maybe we can handle that through Alch. Sometime later, Mr. Dean called me and asked me to tell McCord that the bail money presented too many problems and that maybe consideration could be given to paying premiums. I later called McCord and reported this. His reaction was, I am negotiating with a new attorney and maybe he can get it handled. This is the last conversation I have had to date with James McCord. Although this is a lengthy statement, I wish to make two further points. At no time in any conversations with Mr. McCord did I advise, pressure, or threaten him in an attempt to make him accept the offer of executive clemency. I viewed my role simply as one of a messenger, and while I tried to give both Mr. Dean and Mr. McCord the full flavor of what was going on at both ends of this message transacting process, I actively refrained from injecting myself into the process at either end. I realized at the time of my first conversation in January that I was involved in questionable activity, but I felt that it was important for me to carry this message for the good of the President. I have previously testified before the grand jury, and I've spoken on two other occasions with the United States Attorney's Office and I've spoken on two occasions as well with Senate investigators. Although I have discussed the matter of whether any of my actions could be viewed as violations of the criminal law with my attorney and have been advised of the availability of privileges and possible attempts of securing immunity from prosecution, at no time have I refused to answer any question in regard to my conduct and I have felt that it is more important that I be able to speak freely about my involvement in actions herein than to have whatever protection might be rightfully mine under my constitutional and executive privileges. I hope that what I have to say here today will assist the committee in its investigations and if, upon a hearing of all the facts, it is thought that I am guilty of some wrongdoing, I will still feel that the truth is my best defense. Mr. Caulfield, thank you very much for your lengthy but very useful statement. It's now 410 in the afternoon. The chairman has been called to the floor of the Senate to participate in the debate on a matter now pending on which we will shortly vote. Before he left the committee, he suggested that we conclude your prepared statement today on the condition that you and your attorney are agreeable to returning in the morning at 10 o'clock so that the committee and staff can proceed with the interrogation. Is that satisfactory to you? Absolutely, Senator. Then I, the committee will stand in recess until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. concludes John Caulfield's opening statement, a history that begins with his birth and ends with his involvement in trying to convince James McCord to join the Watergate team and go to jail. Quietly, please. Although Caulfield's statement was filled with details, there's no doubt that the committee will have questions for him. 
particularly over the precise instructions White House Counsel John Dean gave him about approaching McCord. Caulfield returns to the witness stand hot seat tomorrow. All right, with each new day of hearings, new departments of the government get pulled into the widening investigation. One that appears to be foundering at this point involves the Justice Department. The nomination of Elliot Richardson as Attorney General is still awaiting confirmation tonight, and at the federal courthouse earlier today, there were reports that the prosecutor in the Watergate case, Earl Silbert, might be stepping down to let the new special prosecutor, due to be Archibald Cox, take over. With us tonight is a man who has served in the U.S. Attorney's Office, working with the grand jury here in Washington. Bill Greenhall is now a professor at Georgetown University Law School. Bill, are the problems at justice as, as bad as they appear to be at this point? Well, you have to remember since January 1969, we've had three attorney generals. <clears throat> one has been indicted. Uh, one has resigned, and one is having a heck of a time getting confirmed. So in the short space of four years, uh, I would say uh, so goes the head of the department, uh, which it only can affect the main, you know, the day-to-day -day operations uh, of the main Justice Department, and especially um, the problems as they exist in the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in the District of Columbia. The U.S. Attorney's Office in the district is the largest one nationally, there are 140 lawyers. And um, in reference to Mr. Silbert, uh, he is the principal assistant, so that means he's number two out of a team of uh, 140. And I think um, hearing this tonight, I, I think it would be uh, a big mistake for him to do something precipitously at this time without prior consultation with Mr. Cox, because you have to understand one thing. Mr. Silbert's been working behind closed doors with 23 citizens for the District of Columbia and a federal grand jury, and, and none of us really know very much what's been going on, how many witnesses have been interviewed, what they've been testifying to, um, possibility of discussions of grants of immunity, certain key witnesses and all that. And so behind those doors is, is an awful lot of uh, explosive material that I'm sure uh, ultimately would come forth in, in some sort of indictments. But I think he should um, he should uh, wait, obviously, and talk to Mr. Cox before he makes that kind of a decision. Well, you know, the, uh, the problems between the committee and uh, Mr. Silbert and the prosecuting team over the federal grand jury have been developing for some time, even before the hearings began. There were statements that uh, the calling of witnesses and that the the uh, holding of the hearings at this point uh, might uh, work to the detriment of prosecute to the prosecution of people later. There were also uh, this whole business on immunity involving John Dean, which still has not been resolved. Uh, Sam Dash, of course, who was the majority counsel, did say today in, a, in various interviews that uh, he felt the Justice Department was not cooperating by waiving their their right. What is it, Bill? Ten days plus twenty days. Ten days notice and twenty day deferral period. Uh huh. And <clears> so that means that John <throat> Dean could not appear uh, in the logical sequence, as it right. is, uh, which would mean he should follow. Uh, if you are constructing a story, right, at least right. uh, he should follow the testimony of John mm. Caulfield. But it may be the middle of, of uh, June before uh, that can happen. Yeah. Now, what about this whole relationship between the special prosecutor and the existing prosecutor team? Uh, does it sound plausible to you that Mr. Cox uh, would uh, want the existing prosecutor team to step aside and let him step in well, now? that's why I think there has to be some sort of a meeting for ascertainment from a first-hand appraisal of where the, the, the three-team prosecutors are right now, or Mr. Silver, Mr. Glanzer, and Mr. Campbell, where they've come from. And this is not to say that uh, a lot of this could not have been developed with a great deal more thoroughness uh, and, and proper care since uh, the break-in on June 17th. After all, they've had jurisdiction mm -hmm. over this matter since uh, for almost uh, almost 11 months. And so I'm not I'm not saying the U.S. Attorney's Office has been uh, the most diligent under these circumstances, and certainly until uh, I think the McCord letter of March uh, March 19th to Judge Sirica. Mm -hmm. Did the uh, did they really begin begin to understand the the ramifications of, uh, of what this what this cover up operation was all about? Let me ask you a quickie about uh, John Caulfield. Did he incriminate himself today and any other? Well, of course, he hasn't even been charged with anything at this point. Did his testimony incriminate well, himself? Well, if, if you a, a literal reading of being a messenger boy for an offer 
of something of value to a witness regarding his testimony. And of course, he alleges today, for the first time of his own personal knowledge, you know, primary evidence uh, of this kind of offer would be a possible violation of, of Title 18, United States Code, Section 201H, which is um, bribery of a witness in a federal district court. Now, we, we have to understand nobody yet who's testified up there has either been granted immunity or taken the Fifth Amendment with regard to privilege against self-incrimination. Everybody who has who has testified has done freely on the advice mm -hmm. of counsel and has done it in a voluntary, uh, not voluntary manner. In my opinion, uh, as a messenger, uh, with full knowledge of what was being done, he could be charged as an aider and a better, certainly, in, a, in that type of a prosecution, or a possible, uh, a possible co-conspirator, maybe in a conspiracy case. But I would think they'd be more interested in his testimony as a voluntary witness rather than than one who'd be under uh, under pain of an indictment. Okay, Bill Greenhall, thank you very much. All right, the first three days of testimony before Senator Irvin's committee have uncovered a trail of involvement that leads to the top levels of the White House. For a look at what new turns may be revealed tomorrow, we turn right after the hearings to impact correspondent Peter Kay. He was on duty in the Senate caucus room all day. Peter, what's next? Well, we come right back here tomorrow, Jim, and uh, Mr. Caulfield will be back on the witness stand this time to answer questions from the committee councils and from the senators themselves. After he gets through testifying, and I suspect he'll be through by tomorrow, we then get to the man that he hired to do the investigations, another former New York policeman, Anthony Ulazowicz. We're still frying some pretty small fish here now. We are still at the very beginning. We're on a low level, a non-policy-making level. As we take the next big step up the line in this particular inquiry, it will lead us into middle and higher level people at the White House and the committee, and that's when it's really going to be interesting to see if these people can balance their own personal involvement with what the committee's trying to get after. Okay. Thank you, Peter. And that's uh, Peter Kay's uh, prediction. We'll see how it turns out. As you know, we'd like to hear your reaction to our entire coverage of the hearings. Drop us a line if you're so moved to do so. What you say will influence what we do next time. Our address is at Impact, Post Office Box 300, Washington, D.C., 20044. That's Impact, Box 300, Washington, 20044. All right, we'll be back tomorrow night with our unedited hearings. So much has happened that it is understandably difficult to summarize. But one thing we did learn today is that President Nixon has found it impossible to hold to his resolve to put the Watergate behind him and concentrate on other aspects of governing. As you know, that's what he said he would do in his April 30th speech, and that's what he's now finding difficult, if not impossible. John Caulfield returns to the hearings tomorrow, and so does Robert McNeil. For Peter Kay and Impact, I'm Jim Lara. Thank you, and good night. From Washington, you've been watching gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. This coverage is made possible by grants for special events coverage from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation, and has been a production of NPACT, a division of the Greater Washington Educational Telecommunications Association.